The Lost Caverns of Ixalan brought with it a slew of new commander options, and the one that's caught my eye has been Zoyoa Lava Tongue. Zoyoa is a 2-2 Goblin Warlock with Death Touch for 1 black and 1 red. At the beginning of your end step, if you descended this turn, each opponent may discard a card or sacrifice a permanent. Zoyoa will deal 3 damage to each opponent who did neither. This utilizes the new Descend mechanic from the set. Descending simply occurs whenever a permanent card is put into your graveyard from anywhere. This could be from a discard effect, mill, sacrifice, or even put from exile into a graveyard, making this a very easy ability to trigger. Just do keep in mind, the card sent to the graveyard must be a permanent. Zoyoa is in very ideal colors to be a disruptive, almost torturous commander deck. By giving opponents the option to give up one of their resources, whether it's their hand advantage or their board state, lest they take three damage of course, you're going to be able to keep them off of their tempo. Zoyoa being so aggressively costed gives you the edge to begin your strategy the turn he hits play. You can approach this in a number of ways. You can do Classic Aristocrats, an 8-rack strategy that'll disrupt hand advantage with discard abilities, or even, dare I say, stacks. And if you're truly a monster, you could of course go the Infect route as Zoyoa is dealing damage. In this case, giving him Infect will shorten the clock substantially. But anyway, enough of that. We're going to begin this deck with the cards that will cause us to descend. Angie's Ravager is a 3-3 three, three for 3 that has to attack each combat if able. When it attacks, we discard our entire hand and then draw 3 cards. Now because we're going to be discarding cards in our own hand frequently, it's likely that we will run out of cards in hand as well, even with the card draw that we're utilizing. With this, we not only get to trigger the Descend ability if we discard a permanent, but we also get to draw three cards. This card also has Madness, so we can cast it for its Madness cost should we discard it. Cunning Lethmancer is a three drop that has an upkeep ability that forces each player to discard a card. With this in play, we will almost always have the opportunity to hit that Descend ability. I do include several cards similar to this that have a pretty clean ability that makes triggering Zoyoa much easier. Inti Seneschal of the Sun is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two that has an attack trigger. Whenever you attack, you may discard a card. If you do, put a plus one plus one counter onto target attacking creature, and it gains trample until the end of turn. In addition, whenever you discard one or more cards, you may exile the top card of your library, and you may play that card until your next end step. This is tremendous value, as we can pump up a creature, and because we can discard a card through the attack trigger, we will also trigger the second ability, giving us some impulsive card draw. Now because it says we may play the exiled card, we even can play lands should they be the cards exiled, making this a tremendous asset to speeding up our game plan. Jaxus the Troublemaker is a 4 mana 2-3 with one important activated ability. For one red mana, tapping it and discarding a card, we can create a token that's a copy of another target creature we control. It gains haste, and when it dies, we draw a card. We must sacrifice that token at the beginning of the next end step, and we can only utilize this ability at sorcery speed. Unfortunately, the token being sacrificed does not trigger to send, but the discarded card that we pitched for the cost might, if it's a permanent card. We can use the Blitz cost to cast it for 2 mana. It gains haste, and then we have to sacrifice it at the end step. This has a lot of applications and can get us some extra ETB abilities, extra attackers, and given some of the value engines in our deck being on creatures, this can give us tremendous value. Kroxa, Titan of Death's Hunger, is a 6-6 Elder Giant for 2 mana. When it enters the battlefield, we sacrifice it unless it escaped. To have it escape, which is an alternate way to cast it from our graveyard, we pay 2 each of black and red and then exile 5 other cards from our graveyard. Whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks, each opponent discards a card and then each opponent who didn't discard a non-land card this way loses 3 life. This synergizes very nicely with Zoyoa, as we are forcing opponents to remove more of their hand, and should they choose to pitch a land, perhaps in an attempt to conserve more of their better cards, they will still lose 3 life. Just remember going forward, the bits of life they lose here or there from various resources will begin to add up until it becomes threatening. Magus of the Wheel is rather simple, it's a wheel of fortune on a creature. We can use this to wheel each player, and as long as at least one card of what we discard was a permanent, we will get our descent trigger. You're going to see later on we run cards to capitalize on our heavy discard theme. Plague Crafter is our edict creature as it has several nodes of removal on it that will guarantee we get a card from each opponent. Rankle, Master of Pranks, is probably my favorite card in the deck. This is a 3-3 for 4 mana with both Flying and Haste, and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, we can choose any number of the following three abilities. Each player discards a card, 
each player loses one life and draws a card, and then each player sacrifices a creature. This will be a huge target for opponents since we will aim this at whoever can't block this, just so we can get the ability off. I tend to choose all three with this just to do the most amount of damage. Stalactite Stalker is a 1-drop one 1-1 one, one with Menace. At the beginning of your end step, if you descended this turn, you put a plus 1 plus 1 counter onto the Stalker. You can also pay 3, sacrifice it, to have target creature get minus X minus X until the end of turn, where X is the power of Stalactite Stalker. This is efficient and relevant removal, as it gets bigger as we descend more, and in a pinch, we can sacrifice it to act as straightforward creature removal. Speaking of, Stitcher's Supplier is pretty simple and straightforward. When it enters the battlefield or dies, we mill three. Change of Fortune, Dark Deal, Faithless Looting, and Siphon Mind are our sorcery package for both wheel effects and draw effects. We also use Brass's Tunnel Grinder, an artifact that wheels us but lets us draw one extra. At the beginning of our end step, if we descended this turn, we put a boar counter onto it. If there are three or more boar counters on it, we transform it into the powerful Tukutlan the Searing Rift, a cave that taps for red. Whenever we cast a permanent spell using the mana produced by Tukutlan, we discover X, where X is that spell's mana value. When you discover, you reveal the top card of your library until you hit a card that costs X or less, and then you can either cast it without paying its mana cost, or add it to your hand. The rest go to the bottom of your library. This is a tremendous value engine. We can easily get this thing flipped, and then it becomes a powerful land that will help us dig into our deck for more threats. Collector's Vault is coming in clutch again, letting us pay 2 and tap it to draw a card and discard a card and create a treasure. I oftentimes will choose to discard creatures like Kroxa so I can set up later plays while still triggering my descend mechanics. Currency Converter is a bit of a weird interaction with our descend as it acts as almost a non-bow at first. It exiles the card that we discard from our graveyard. We can also pay 2 and tap it to loot in the same vein as the Collector's Vault. We can also tap it to move a card exiled with the converter into the graveyard. If it's a land, we make a treasure token. If it's a non-land, we create a 2-2 black rogue creature token. This actually can pan out nicely as we protect our graveyard with this from cards like Bajuka Bog, but still reserve our ability to move those cards back into the graveyard should they be discarded on, say, our opponent's turn. This way, we could still trigger the descent on our turn, as those cards will have moved into the graveyard during our turn. Grimoire of the Dead is one of my favorite cards, and it makes yet another appearance here. We can pay one and tap the Grimoire to discard a card and put a study counter onto the Grimoire. We can also tap it, remove the three study counters from the Grimoire, and then sacrifice it to put every creature from every graveyard into play under our control. They gain the zombie creature type as well. This is my favorite win condition, as we can spend a good deal of the game sending creatures to the graveyard, and then use this to bring them all back in one mass reanimation spell to win us the game. Hazard's Monument has a cool cost reductions clause for red spells, but the real value is the second ability, letting us pitch a card whenever we cast a creature spell, and if we do, we draw a card. Again, a very clean and simple way to put cards into the graveyard. Key to the City is a card that I wanted to take in a test run. I can tap it to discard a card and make up to one target creature unblockable this turn. Whenever it becomes untapped, you can pay two mana to draw a card. It's dual value on a rather subtle artifact. Matzalanti, the Great Door, is a legendary artifact that can tap to draw a card and then discard a card. You can also pay four and tap it to transform it, but only if there are four or more permanent types in your graveyard. We run lands, enchantments, artifacts, and creatures to hit just exactly those types. It flips into the core, which is a legendary land that taps for X mana of any one color, where X is the number of permanents in your graveyard. This card rewards us for our descending and reckless discarding by giving us a huge boost of mana. The Grim Captain's Locker is another fun card that we can tap to let us surveil one. This can easily help us trigger the descend. But what's more, we can tap it, and until the end of turn, each creature card in our graveyard gains escape for 3 and 1 black and exile 4 other cards from your graveyard. So here's the deal. Underworld Breach is absurdly powerful, and it would of course do well in this deck given how much we're filling our graveyard. But I think it might be too excessive, and aside from offering us a win condition that would undoubtedly nudge us into a higher power level, I didn't want this deck to draw that kind of attention with a single card not to the level that the Breach would bring. 
The Grim Captain's Locker gives us a bit more of a balanced version of what Underworld Breach does and has additional value in its other ability. Necrogen Mists makes each player discard a card, ensuring that we can trigger that Descend. What's more is given how much discard we have at our disposal, our opponents will likely have few if any cards in hand. Oppression will also see to that, making every spell that every player casts come with the penalty of discarding a card. Yes, this targets us, but we are built to thrive in this sort of chaos. Tortured Existence is not only the most accurate manifestation of my life in a card, but also does everything for this deck. We can pitch a creature to recur another creature to our hand, turning on Zuyoa at the end step. This is great to mitigate us discarding some of our better cards as we can simply bring them right on back when we're ready to use them. Lastly, Zombie Infestation is a free discard outlet that gives us a 2-2 zombie creature token. I chose this over the other options because I like that the token comes out untapped, unlike many other zombie generators. Now then, we've discussed how we will trigger our Descend mechanic, let's now go through the cards that will give us value for all of these discard and sacrifice antics. Aklazots has an attack trigger that forces each opponent to discard a card, and each who can't discard, you get to draw a card. Now, if a card discarded by an opponent is ever a land, we get a 1-1 flying bat token. When Aklazots dies, it comes back to the battlefield transformed as Temple of the Dead, a land that taps for black. You can also pay 3 to transform it back, but only if a player has 1 or fewer cards in their hand and only at sorcery speed. Archfiend of Ifnir has an ability that triggers whenever you cycle or discard a card, putting a minus 1 minus 1 counter onto each creature your opponent's controls. If we wheel our hand, depending on the size of our hand, this could in theory wipe out our opponent's creatures. Blood Artist is largely self-explanatory and will punish our opponents for sacrificing their creatures or killing ours. Bone Miser gives us value when we discard our cards, giving us a 2-2 zombie whenever we pitch a creature, 2 black mana whenever we discard a land, and a non-creature, non-land card will let us draw a card. Containment Construct is a unique tech I included since we discard so many of our own cards. This lets us exile a discarded card from the graveyard, and during the turn that we do so, we can play that card. This, in a way, gives a similar ability to Madness, ensuring that we're not losing our cards entirely when we discard them. Enterprising Scallywag checks at the end step, similar to Zoyoa, if we descended. If we did, we create a treasure token. Full disclosure, I don't run Dockside Extortionist in this deck, but this is more or less my on-theme variant of Dockside. We're getting treasures for doing the thing we want to do with this deck, but only once per turn rotation. Mayhem Devil pings any target whenever a player sacrifices a permanent. Given how much sacrifice this deck can do, whether it's ours, whether it's our opponents, from treasure tokens to copy tokens to creatures or fetches, we can really start building up the hurt on a single player. Mogus God of Slaughter forces opponents to sack a creature at their upkeep or take 2 damage. It's pretty straightforward. Sangramancer gives us 3 life for each instance of an opponent letting a creature they control die, or each time they discard a single card. I'm normally not big on passive cards like this, but given how much our deck will have us losing life, and how hard our opponents will be trying to get us out of the game, I want something to help pad my life total. Given that this is a single card trigger ability, we will gain a ton of life. The Raven Man is a card that I've wanted to put into a deck for quite a while, and this deck might be the one. At the beginning of each end step, if a player discarded a card this turn, we create a 1-1 black bird token that cannot block. We can also pay 3 in a black to force each opponent to discard a card, but this card can only be used at sorcery speed. Tiny Bones Trinket Thief is a small, unassuming 1-2 two for 2. At the beginning of each end step, if an opponent discarded a card this turn, you draw a card and lose 1 life. We will have opponents discarding a lot of cards every turn. This will give us a ton of card draw as the turn cycles complete, and what's even more evil is that we will likely have opponents sitting with empty hands, so Tiny Bones' second ability is even more relevant. For 6 mana, each opponent who has 0 cards in hand loses 10 life. Geth's Grimoire draws us a card whenever an opponent discards a card. This is simple but effective card draw that plays off our opponents losing their resources. With Zoyoa out, this will really start to impact their decision as to what they want to sacrifice. Do they sacrifice their permanence, take 3 damage, or give us card draw as they have to discard a card? 
Court of Ambition is perhaps the meanest card in the deck. Might have let a little bit of sadistic tendencies come into this deck, but I really wanted to make this deck miserable to play against. When the court comes into play, you become the monarch. Alrighty there, Vlad the Impaler, what else? At the beginning of your upkeep, each opponent loses 3 life unless they've discarded a card. If you're a monarch, instead they lose 6 life unless they discard 2 cards. That should all be fine and dandy, right? Well, I'll be damned. Liliana's Caress is in here too, so if they discard 2 cards, they're still losing life, 2 life per card. I really wanted this deck to put your opponents on the spot, where they'll be damned if they do, damned if they don't. Liliana's Caress works out quite nicely with Zoyoa's ability, because they're still going to lose some life if they choose to just discard a card. And while 2 damage versus 3 damage might seem like a minor amount of damage, as the flow of the game continues, these incremental nibbles at their life total will begin dropping them low enough that they should be concerned. Along those same lines, I have Pain Magnification, which is the card that really inspired all of this deck. Should an opponent be dealt 3 or more damage by a single source, they have to discard a card. This is so mean with Zoyoa, so with this out, they can either choose to discard a card and deal with the things in play that might punish them for discarding, or they can choose to sacrifice a permanent and deal with the things in play that might punish them for sacrificing a permanent. Or they can take 3 damage from Zoyoa, and then something like this will then force them to discard a card anyway, and then the punishments come. It's unfortunate that Liliana's Crest only causes opponents to lose 2 life, which is both too little of damage to trigger this, let alone the type of life loss to trigger this. See, the benefit with Zoyoa that works so well with so many cards is that Zoyoa is actually dealing damage. It's effect damage, but it's still damage. Cards like Liliana's Caress will cause a loss of life, but that is not considered to be damage. So even if we were to add in something that would increase the damage caused by Liliana's Caress, it would still not be able to trigger the pain magnification and cause whatever sorts of combos that you could do with that. Lastly, Waste Knot is the iconic discard card draw engine thing. This gives us the same kind of value as the Bone Miser, only these are going to get triggered off of our opponents doing the discard. You get 2-2 two, two zombies for each creature discarded, 2 black mana for each land discarded, and a card drawn for non-creature, non-land cards. The best way to play this deck is to establish means to force opponents into compromise very early on, and then drop Zoyoa so we can get his ability going the turn he hits play. Even something as simple as a fetch land can really get his ability online, and so if you have the resources for it, feel free to add in more fetch lands. The goal is to cut opponents off of their lifelines as early as we can, so as the game progresses, they have less access to resources than us. As a nice idea for a follow-up, attacking the players who opt to take the 3 damage will give them a lower life total, and that life total becomes less appealing as a resource. Some other cards that I thought might be fun to include, but I chose not to for one reason or another, is cards like Master of Cruelties. This 1-4 with First Strike and Death Touch can only be declared an attacker if it is the only one being declared, and if it is unblocked, it deals no combat damage, but the defending player's life total becomes 1. This is absurdly strong considering the context of this deck, as the opponent will suddenly be unable to pay the life for Zoyoa. It paints too much of a target on us, and since we're already going to be a target, I chose to admit it. The other fun package, put fun in air quotes there, did you see, is in fact. See, Zoyoa deals those three points of damage, but should he have in fact, be it something like, say, from Phyresis or Grafted Exoskeleton, those three points of damage will actually be converted into three poison counters, making it far more important for opponents to hold up cards to discard or permanents to sacrifice instead. You only need to put ten poison counters onto a player for them to immediately lose the game, and so only three instances of Zoyoa dealing that three damage, plus maybe another point of combat damage, is all it takes. We may explore a nastier build of this deck at some point in the future that will take advantage of Infect, just to see how powerful we can go with this build. Let me know if that's something you'd like to see in the future. But for now, that will wrap up our look at our little Gabo friend. What are your thoughts on Zoyoa? Are there some spicy tech cards that you included in your build? If you enjoyed this video, which I hope you did, likes and shares are the best way to help support this channel. If you're new here and like what you see, subscribe to never miss a video. And as always, I'll catch you all next time.